last time we reminded ourselves of the amazing fact that God is committed to communication, to revelation. This is interwoven with his grace because nothing compels him to communicate. No one earns the right to hear from God. And more than simply making truth available, he pays the cost of giving people genuine access to his revelation of himself. He invites us, his body on earth, to share in this commitment and, like him, to gladly pay the cost. We also talked about access in terms of how familiar an individual or a group is with the language in which they have the Bible available. This is not only relevant in cross-cultural church planning contexts, but also in our own multicultural contexts. And finally, we thought about the need to use every available means to communicate God's truth without distorting the message. Let's look at the second question under W for Word. Are they having God's Word presented to them in a way that allows it to enter and engage their hearts at a worldview level? This question is really an extension of the first one that we looked at in the last tutorial, although that was specifically talking about the form in which a person or a group of people are accessing the Bible itself. In other words, the language or the medium in which it's available. But now we want to consider the way God's Word is being presented to them by others, perhaps by us. Here we're looking at more than just the words, sentences, and and paragraphs of the Bible itself, uh, what the Bible itself calls inspired or breathed out by God. We now want to consider how a person or a group is having God's inspired, unchanging, and infallible written word shared with them. Again, what we're concerned most with is their degree of real access to God's revelation of truth. If we were primarily focusing here on the presentation of God's Word in the more formal corporate setting of a church, the kind that many of us from traditional Christian backgrounds are most familiar with, then we'd be talking about homiletics. In other words, the art of preaching or writing sermons. And of course, in many contexts, what is taught from the church's pulpit is most definitely a key part of the picture. In fact, as we move on to other wild questions, Uh, The whole area of how people are hearing God's word taught authoritatively within the setting of the gathered ecclesia will, in fact, come into more focus. But for now, we're starting further back and asking a more general question about any situation uh, where someone is not just reading or listening to the Bible, but where they're also having it presented or shared or explained to them. Questions about the form in which the explanation comes to them are very similar to those we asked about the form of the Bible itself. If someone is not familiar with the language of the scriptural text they are engaging with, then it will also be challenging for them to understand any additional comments that are being made about it. As we said, it isn't our intention in this curriculum to make pronouncements like everyone should be taught in their first language. But to put our cards on the table, as it were, we do hold to heart language communication of truth as an ideal that should be vigorously pursued in many contexts. For one thing, our theology leads us to understand that God places a premium on there being representation from every language, every ethnic group in his church and ultimately around his throne. His glory will shine out for all eternity in its, in its great richness because it will be seen through a multifaceted prism that's made up from, of people from every nation and tribe and people and language praising him. So that in itself is a very potent reason for valuing opportunities to share God's truth with people in their own languages. Uh, secondly, Our experience and all the evidence we see leads us to conclude that a group that has had truth consistently presented in their own language, given many other factors that are touched on in the wild outline, uh, that those people have a greater chance of growing and bearing fruit than, than those that only have access to a language they've had to learn. 
But given that our perspective here is wider, taking into account the whole range of possible scenarios we can consider for sharing God's word, perhaps the way we can state this, uh, this principle is along these lines. God's gracious commitment to providing access is compelling motivation for us, his co-workers, to keep moving towards the best possible forms of sharing his word with others, whatever that means in the situation. But back to our question about are they having God's word presented to them in a way that allows it to enter and engage their hearts at a worldview level. When we talk about allowing God's word to do something, we're not inferring that as humans we control its inherent power. God says that his word is like a fire and a, and a hammer that smashes rocks to pieces. That's in uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23, 29. And Paul called the good news about Christ, which by extension refers to the, the whole of God's word that points forward and backward to him. He calls all of that the power of God at work. And that, of course, is Romans 1.16. Elsewhere, it's said to be alive and, and powerful, cutting through people's pretenses and, and defenses uh, like a, a super sharp sword, Hebrews 4.12. Charles Spurgeon famously likened God's word to a, a lion that shouldn't so much be defended as let loose. So when we consider how God's word is being presented to someone, we're obviously not questioning the power of God's word. What we're asking to badly mix these metaphors is whether the fire is being fanned, the, the power is being unleashed, the, the hammer is being wielded, if the, the sword is piercing and the lion has been let loose. This touches, as do so many things, on the mystery of how God's sovereignty coexists with human free will and how God channels his infinite wisdom and power through finite, flawed human beings like, like us. But we know those things do coexist. And, and he sends us out as his witnesses, as his storytellers, and as his disciple makers. Before he left the earth, Jesus sent the disciples out and through them all his church with the responsibility of teaching disciples from all the world's ethnic groups. The Holy Spirit came and gave and continues to give different ones in the Ecclesia special abilities or gifts for specific teaching roles in different situations. Paul, you'll remember writing to his young disciple and co-worker Timothy, described himself as a preacher, uh, an apostle, and a teacher of the good news. He said that Timothy is to hold on to the good teaching that he's heard from Paul. Uh, to carefully guard this treasure so it's not changed or eroded. And, and then he's to pass it on intact to other trustworthy people who will do the same. That's in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11 to uh, chapter 2, verse 2. Later in that same letter, Paul describes a servant of the church like Timothy as having the resource within God's inspired word to teach people so that they realize where their thoughts and actions are inconsistent with truth. And so they can realign them and live as, God's, as God wants to and to equip themselves uh, to be productive in their contribution to his purposes. So when we consider a specific situation where God's word is being shared, we need to ask ourselves if it is being done in such a way that it allows its inherent power to flow freely. Does the person sharing, and, and that might well be us, do they take very seriously the responsibility and privilege? Are their own lives aligned to the truth uh, that, that they're sharing? Are they gifted by God's Spirit for teaching in this particular kind of setting? Are they properly equipped and, and can they explain it and, and apply it faithfully? Our question, our wild question, uses three words that take us further in considering the access that a person or group is being given to God's word. It talks about enter, engage, and worldview. Uh, 
It digs down into the responsibility God gives to us as his witnesses, his truth bearers. It recognizes that we haven't necessarily communicated just because we've said something. Even if we share a basic language with someone, we can all think of many instances in which the words we've used in a conversation have not ended up in clear communication. Of course, there can be any number of reasons for confusion and misunderstandings, but one way of describing the most foundational layer in which communication does or doesn't happen is worldview. In other parts of the Access Truth resources, we discuss this concept of worldview in much more depth uh, than we will here. Uh, you can see that in tutorials uh, 6.1 to 6.4. We utilize the definition uh, by James Sire uh, that is slightly technical perhaps, but it's helpful nonetheless for our purposes of considering whether or not the way truth is being presented helps someone to have access or not. Sire says that worldview is a commitment, a fundamental orientation of the heart that can be expressed as a story or in a set of presuppositions, uh, assumptions which may be true, partially true or entirely false, that we hold consciously or subconsciously, consistently or inconsistently about basic constitution of reality and that provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being. There are some very far-reaching implications of the reality that people don't just have certain beliefs and values in the way that someone has a certain hair color or a particular accent. As Sire correctly identifies, when we talk about someone's worldview, we're talking about things they're committed to, they're invested in. If a shipwreck survivor has been holding on to something grimly for days to keep themselves afloat, there's every chance they'll find it difficult to loosen their grip when a, a rescue boat finally arrives. People don't easily let go of the story or the, the explanation that they are told by themselves, by their society and by Satan, the story that makes sense of everything for them. The fingers of their soul, so to speak, have to be holding on so tightly to their worldview for so long that it's painful to even open their hands so they can let go and reach for the truth. These commitments are on a cognitive level, in other words, related to logic and, and conscious thought, but they're also emotional. As Sire says, they're an orientation of the heart. It's the default direction of their lives uh, that their lives are heading towards, like a compass needle swinging back to point to north. And so people have often never stopped to analyze what it is that is really motivating and driving them to be who they are or valuing the things that they do. They don't know or often don't care to know why they think, uh, speak and act the way they do. There's a strong impulse against that kind of scrutiny. It's too confronting, too risky, too painful for them. And this worldview that each person holds is comprehensive in the sense that it tries to explain all of his or her experience. Human beings are created specifically to be the listeners, the active participating audience for God's true story of all things. Of course, we're fallen and corrupted through our choice to tell our own small false stories, but we're still created to live in this world and to have a sense made of it for us. That's not at all to say that people's worldviews are always coherent, that they don't have many gaps and inconsistencies. They do. Uh, but the difficulty that people face is finding any ground from which to evaluate the contradictions and weaknesses. They can't take off the glasses of their worldview to look at themselves or anything else without it. To change the metaphor, it's like the water in which a, which a fish swims. It, it has no point of reference to imagine any other way of existing. So the first thing we should be looking for in any situation where truth is being presented is a real commitment being made to understand the listener's worldview. Good intentions and a passion for sharing the truth are absolutely necessary. 
But a love for Christ and others and a desire to share God's word is not in opposition to a passion for understanding people's worldview commitments and, and their fundamental orientation. In fact, not to do so often demonstrates a lack of love and respect. It demonstrates a preoccupation with ourselves, with our own worldview commitments and orientation. We must be willing to listen to and understand other people's stories before we offer God's wonderful narrative with its complete and satisfying answers that people's hearts really desire. Secondly, if a presentation of God's word is going to enter and engage at the deepest level, it will be in the process of the listeners questioning their worldview commitments and orientation. Far too often, for example, in their eagerness to get to the good part, the good news about Christ, servants of the church fail to carefully prepare the soil, or rather to wait for God's spirit to use his word to prepare the soil. If people's worldview allegiance remains solidly in place, if the alignment of their hearts isn't being challenged, if they're still holding on tightly to their own story, then the sword isn't penetrating, the hammer isn't crushing the stone, and the repentance that precedes faith is not taking place. Finally, any efforts to share truth should be focused on bringing people to stand before God in all his glory and grace. Although different programs and strategies and apologetics, convincing arguments, uh, testimonies, people's personal stories might well have their place, they're only ultimately successful if people are being helped to hear God's own voice speaking to them. It is him revealing himself, telling them his true story, explaining who they actually are, and how they stand in his eyes, drawing their eyes towards the only solution to their true needs, his son Jesus Christ, giving them hope and purpose. This is how truth enters and engages at the fundamental worldview level and produces repentance and life and growth and then fruit. Okay, some extra questions to go along uh, with this, this question under Wilde that we've answered. Are they having God's word presented to them in a way that allows it to enter and engage their hearts at a worldview level? We can now add these extra questions. Are those sharing truth taking the responsibility seriously? Are they qualified, gifted, and equipped for that particular setting? And are they genuinely committed to getting to know and understand the worldview of those they're sharing with? Is God's word being shared in a way that gives the spirit opportunity to prepare the soil by challenging fundamental assumptions, commitments, and alignments? And finally, is truth being shared with people in a way that leads them to stand honestly and humbly before God, and to turn to Jesus Christ as God's answer to their deepest longings and needs.